On July the 20th, the frontiers at the far end of Europe were changed by armed force. The murderous antipathies on Cyprus, the irreconcilable ambitions of Greeks and Turks had finally led to Turkish invasion and humiliating defeat for the Greeks. The war signaled the new rise of an old power. So who are the new young Turks and what are their ambitions? Panorama tonight comes from Turkey. country which senses its military muscles and likes what it feels is like a boxer who knows he's going to win his next fight. Turkey at the moment is such a country. For half a millennium, Turkey was one of the world's great empires and always a military nation. But it hadn't fought a war for over 50 years until last month it landed its troops in Cyprus. This day in Ankara, Friday, is Victory Day when the Turks celebrate their defeat of the Greek army which invaded it after the First World War. It was a victory which gave Turkey its present frontiers. But today also they're celebrating what they regard as a military victory in Cyprus. Turkey is unified as it's never been before. Turkey's armed forces have nearly half a million men. The cavalry are a concession to ceremonial, but the rest of the Turkish army is a real modern fighting force. The heirs of the Ottoman Empire, of its crack imperial guard, the Janissaries, and the fierce men from Asia Minor who once carried Turkish rule through most of the Mediterranean, the Balkans, and to the gates of Vienna itself. In Turkey, the Cyprus intervention has been immensely popular and has released an enthusiasm for their army that few Turks thought they would ever feel. This display of grim-faced militarism and might, when put against the helplessness, the virtual lack of defence of Greek Cyprus, seems much too self-congratulatory. And the easy landing these forces made in Cyprus six weeks ago has produced the nastier face of jingoism, which national military success always seems to spark. This popular song celebrating the war is on sale on the streets as a record. It may be a cheap piece of commercialism of the sort Turkey escapes no more than we do, but among the gewgaws and posters that are hawked in the crowded streets of Ankara, there are those showing the triumphant Turks smashing Cyprus, with the new folk hero, Prime Minister Echevit, smiling down like a latter-day Tamburlaine or Genghis Khan. And the song itself says, you bloody cursed Greek, they made you run for your life, didn't they? And yet, Echevit himself is entirely confident of the reasons for Turkey's armed intervention. The coup initiated by the uh, military regime in Athens and brought uh, Mr. Sampson to power uh, had heralded a new era of terrorism, massacres and anarchy or chaos on the island. And uh, we were sure that that would be the end of the independent state of Cyprus a de facto enosis, even if the name were not to be uttered, and new massacres against the Turkish people. So uh, we felt that if we didn't act in time, everything would have been lost, not only the uh, freedom and safety of the Turks, but the whole state of Cyprus. So <clears throat> we had to do something about it immediately. But uh, <clears throat> we didn't want to resort to military action. That's the reason why I went to Britain immediately after the coup, that is, I went there on the 17th and talked with Mr. Wilson, Mr. Callaghan and their colleagues and inquired uh, if we could do something together as to guarantee pass. Unfortunately, I couldn't receive a positive reply and we didn't have any time to lose, so we acted. Were you bitter about 
the response you got in London from Mr. Wilson and Mr. Callaghan that they could not do anything? No, I had no right to be bitter. Of course, they had to make their own decision, but <clears throat> I thought that there would have been a greater chance, there might have been a greater chance of finding a more peaceful uh, solution to the immediate issue before us, if we could have acted jointly. Whatever the justification of the original landing, you in Turkey lost a lot of world sympathy with the breakdown of the Geneva Conference. There you were negotiating, but you issued an ultimatum. You were asked for just 36 hours to consider it, a question of peace or war, and you would not give it. You went back to war. Yes. What remote justification was there for not giving the 36 hours? Well, we had <clears throat> several uh, reasons uh, and justifications. One is that uh, even in the beginning of this second round of Geneva talks, uh, we had talked uh, we had told the British, uh, Greece, and the island Greeks uh, about our suggestions. It wasn't something new that they learned on the sixth day of the conference. And uh, it was obvious that uh, our proposal uh, would not be acceptable to the Greeks. Uh, we were also sure that they were gain, uh, trying to gain time because after the change of regime in Athens, which we really welcome in Turkey, uh, the Greek government had become aware that uh, they were gaining quickly, regaining prestige in the international world, and they thought that if they had time, uh, they could uh, uh, give the things uh, the direction they wished in the diplomatic field. And another factor, there was a very serious case of security for the Turkish units. You know, uh, they were uh, large units were squeezed in a very small part of the island, and they were exposed to all sorts of dangers. But you had complete military predominance. Yes, but squeezed and almost imprisoned to a small area. They weren't being effective to secure the safety of the Turks elsewhere, and they could not even undertake their own security because they were exposed to all sorts of dangers within a small area surrounded by Greek folks, forces. But Prime Minister, 36 hours is 36 hours, and it's difficult to believe that that short period would have totally changed the military scene. It does look to many outsiders as if you'd always intended to take a stage two and to take what you wanted by force, which is in fact what you did. Yes, but uh, it was a matter of taking risks. We felt that we had taken all the risks we could regarding the security of the Turkish troops on the island by waiting so many days after the first Geneva talks. And uh, there were several indications that the Greeks were after uh, gaining time, after delaying tactics. One cannot escape history when trying to understand the enmity of Greeks and Turks. The Bosphorus, the neck which links the Black Sea with the Mediterranean, is the most important stretch of water in the world. The castles which crowd its banks bear witness to the struggles for its possession. This castle was built 520 years ago by an invading Ottoman Turk. It was constructed in the incredible time of four months from start to finish. It was his invasion base from which to do the unthinkable, to take the great city which stood a few miles downstream on the Bosphorus, Byzantium, Constantinople, for over a thousand years the eastern capital of Christendom, the heir to Greek civilization. He captured Constantinople for Islam, an event to the Middle Ages as shattering as the dropping of the first atom bomb to our age. From then until this century, it remained the capital of the Turkish Empire, Istanbul. With the militant spiritual force of Islam behind it, the empire spread wider and wider, from central Russia to southern Arabia, from Egypt and Tunis to Bulgaria and Austria, and of course, the Turks possessed Greece. Its emperors were despots, but their Turkish and mercenary armies were consummately brave. From their vast palace overlooking the Golden Horn, the great Seraglio, the sultans ruled in luxury, isolated from reality in their pavilions, surrounded by the concubines of their harems. Wealthy beyond any humans before or since, their emeralds and rubies the size of cricket balls. Yet as Europe grew and strengthened, the empire shrank and collapsed. It was the First World War which finally destroyed Ottoman power. The Turks had fought on Germany's side. Afterwards, the Allies carved up the final fag ends of their empire. 
We occupied Istanbul and encouraged the Greeks to invade mainland Turkey. Shattered as they were, the Turks fought off the Greeks. In some of the most savage battles of history, the peasants of Turkish Anatolia routed the Greeks. The fleeing Greeks destroyed everything they could behind them. In return, the Turks expelled over a million Greeks who for centuries had lived in their country. There were appalling atrocities on both sides, new additions to the mythology of hatred. But there was also a new Turkish hero, Kemal Ataturk. Ataturk was the officer who won the only major Turkish victory of the Great War at Gallipoli against the British. After the war for three years, he led Turkey to save itself from the Greek invaders. He was indeed father of the nation, and his memory lives on in the monuments to him which dominate modern Turkey. Because if Turkey had lost an empire, he led it to recognize itself as a viable nation. He completely modernized the country's dress, language, and customs. Islam was disestablished. Turkey was to be a modern Western state. Now, 36 years after Ataturk's death, the Turks are beginning to talk of a new Ataturk, a Bulent Ecevit, their prime minister. He was a member of Ataturk's party, but it had been out of power for years, including two years of virtual military rule. Until last October, he won the largest number of seats in a genuinely free election. He struggled along with a coalition government until the Cyprus crisis unified the country behind him in opposition to Greece. Prime Minister, how do you look at Greece? Greece, during this crisis, has had a change of government, but it's in a position now, since you have the military power on the island, where it would be almost too humiliating for Greece to just give in to you. How do you look at the Greek position? Well, uh, if they looked uh, at their foreign problems, international problems, in a realistic way, they shouldn't uh, have a, a feeling of defeat. But unfortunately, they don't look at uh, these matters in a realistic, from a realistic and contemporary angle. Uh, I have repeatedly said recently that they cherish these uh, <coughs> memoirs, memories of the old Byzantine history. <coughs> they have their, uh, what they call, ideals of Hellenism, of material or spiritual enosis and so forth. Now, any nation in the world who cherishes such dreams of past historic glory would not find rest in the present day world. I gave the example the other day. Suppose Turkey, which has had a much recent, much more recent history of an empire, uh, had similar dreams of annexing the old territories. Where would, he have ended, would Turkey have ended today? We would have been on very bad terms with all our neighbors. Suppose, take uh, Britain, suppose uh, the British wanted to revive, to restore their empire, where would they have ended in the present day world? I think that if the Greeks uh, realize the necessities of the age we are all living in and appreciate that this is not the age of restoring empires, but this is the age where all empires have to end, are ending, and then they could uh, come to terms uh, with our present-day world, uh, with the realities of the region, and uh, they could accommodate themselves to friendship with Turkey. After all, Mr. Mavros himself said recently that uh, Greece and Turkey are condemned to live in friendship. Istanbul is cosmopolitan, bustling, an entrepot, a marketplace. The Golden Horn is the tongue of water stretching into the city, where for thousands of years, Greeks, Romans, and then Turks have watched the world's trade pass from east to west. But Istanbul is now less multinational with the end of the empire. It's becoming profoundly Turkish. The people who flood into the city come mostly from Asia Minor, from Anatolia. Not Mediterranean or Arabic in origins, but a mixture of people originally from Central Asia, black-haired and usually fair-skinned. They come from the great bare steppes and mountains of the Turkish peninsula. A hard place, the poorest nation in Europe, its villages spread out over a vast, inaccessible land mass that is the bridge to Persia and southern Russia. 
slowly modernizing, but the horse is more common than the tractor, the oil lamp than electricity, where illiteracy is nearly 50%. A land from which half a million men go each year to Germany to find work, the famous Gastarbeiter or guest workers, whose remittances of one and a half billion dollars a year are by far and away Turkey's biggest export earning, a land still in part sleeping. But Ataturk's reforms have penetrated even here. The freeing of women from the veil and much of the bondage of conventional Muslim subjection. Turkey has adopted the Swiss legal code for want of a better. And the symbols of westernization and development are proudly shown, particularly the new great suspension bridge, which for the first time has spanned the Bosphorus to link Europe and Asia Minor for the Bosphorus is still a vital key to the great powers. Though its waters are Turkish, its use is regulated by international treaty. Its narrow channel is the route by which Soviet Russia reaches the Mediterranean. The Russian fleet, whose increased presence has so concerned America and NATO, through its channels have poured the arms which fed the flames of Arab-Israeli wars. Two years ago, Panorama's cameras filmed these Russian warships for this reason, if no other, Turkey is a vital strategic interest. It's a member not only of NATO, but also the CENTO alliance, both designed fundamentally to resist Soviet expansion. It's their membership of NATO and the sharing with Greece of the alliance's eastern borders with the communist world, which has added so much alarm to the conflict with Greece for the last six weeks. To the strategic planners in Moscow, this and the Cyprus calamity can only bring comfort. To the West, only division and potential danger. Turkey's membership of NATO has brought with it massive military aid from that universal provider, the United States. This is a main fighter bomber base in the center of Anatolia. The planes are American starfighters. When I visited the base, the squadron was on standby because of the Cyprus crisis. The planes were being loaded with bullets, napalm and bombs for an exercise on the target range. But if the equipment is American, the pilots and personnel are all Turkish. This is not an American satellite, but very much its own master. Turkey is only just coming into the full technological age. When these young men were born, there were less than 10,000 motor cars in the whole country, three times the size of Britain. Now their armed forces are a match for any in the area. This squadron won NATO's gunnery competition last year. left in Turkey is predictably anti-NATO, yet even for them there's little opposition to the strength of Turkey's forces. Even the Marxists are nationalists and support the Cyprus intervention. Has the NATO position been seriously damaged in this part of the Eastern Mediterranean and what is your own attitude now to NATO? Well, uh, we could, um, the Turco greek cooperation within NATO, which was the basis of the south flank, the southeast flank of NATO, had not been operating for some time, in any case, in spite of ourselves. After all, we couldn't even hold the joint maneuvers uh, that come under the NATO programs. I think the uh, Greek decision to withdraw from the military structure of NATO 
will not change the actual situation very much, but what we needed to do was to change the actual situation, that is to make full cooperation between Turkey and Greece within and outside NATO possible. I think both countries has a lot to gain from that, and uh, the whole of our region would gain from that. This was a mixed village of Greeks and Turks. It's clear that many of the Turkish Cypriot men in it were killed, an act of violence which has certainly been committed in reverse in other places, but which here has left the Turkish women in a state of shock and continued alarm for their safety. Because the mainland Turkish army is now just outside the village, the Greeks have largely evacuated themselves and their families, driving off with their possessions to refugee safety. But the Turks have been unable to move because the Greek National Guard still has its men in the village and won't let them go. It keeps the road closed that would let them escape to join up with the Turkish army. Two British soldiers of the UN force are trying to mediate. You can guarantee the yes. lives of the Turks? Yes, yes. How can you guarantee? The Turkish are in this village from a month. Yeah. You can ask to the Turkish if you have any... But if you say you can guarantee them, why are they so unhappy here? The Turkish? Mm. I think they are happy. You think so? I'd yeah. say the opposite, Mr. When they're crying, that's happy. It's the Turkish Cypriot communities like these, which are still cut off in the island's communal confusion, that are the strongest provocation for further Turkish action. But in Ankara, despite the constant publicity when atrocities are uncovered in Cyprus, the most important public demonstration of grief was at the funeral of a Turkish journalist. He'd been caught by the Cypriot National Guard and allegedly shot while blindfolded. This death appears to have shocked the Turkish capital more than any other. He was given virtually a state funeral. As his picture was carried through the streets in the cortege, Turks were saying, how can we be accused of barbarity in the world's press? Here was a man doing his job protected by the Geneva Convention and shot down in cold blood. That's barbarity. Of all charges against them, of all images of themselves, they resent. It's the one that they are barbarous people, Asians, not members of the humanist West. In private, it's admitted that the Turks have done tough things themselves in Cyprus, but that's the toughness of war, they say. So a non-combatant journalist is their symbol of Greek barbarity. To the mosque came virtually every member of the cabinet. When Mr. Echevit arrived and walked in to pay his respects, the crowd started to applaud their new hero. Echevit himself was a journalist and he has a flair for publicity. On this occasion, he would have none of it, but his capacity for communication with his people is exceptional, and it's in his hands that much of the hope for a settlement rests. Prime Minister, I can't ask you to negotiate in public, but are you prepared to say that Turkey is prepared to give up part of the territory it now holds as part of a, of a settlement? Well, I have said uh, several times that uh, the demarcation of the Turkish Cypriot control area uh, is negotiable within reasonable bounds. Uh, it's obvious what I mean by this, but I use the term negotiable. So we should first start negotiating and we will put this matter on the table. That's all that I can say. And I have also said that if uh, sufficient security measures, particularly for the Turks living outside the Turkish controlled area, are taken, 
which is that they should be allowed to migrate to the Turkish-controlled area if they wish. Once this is secured, we could start the phased reduction of the Turkish forces on the island, even without waiting for the start of the negotiations. Looking at Cyprus now, Prime Minister, there's no doubt that the areas that your troops have taken are economically the best bits of Cyprus. And they've taken them so firmly that you do have virtually effective partition. Is this a fair comment, that the rest of Cyprus that is left, Greek Cyprus, is virtually impossible to run as, an, as a viable economy? Uh, well, I don't think so. After all, uh, they can still uh, have industry and touristic industries flourish. But you, in those... you have Farmagusta and Kyrenia, which are the two yes, main places. Yes, yes. But uh, this was not uh, done for economic purposes, but that was the most convenient part of the island to have under our control geographically concerning, uh, considering Turkey's proximity but, to that part of the land. But I, I repeat, it is economically the heartland of the yes, country. Yes, so it seems. But after all, uh, for a long time, uh, the Turks suffered very heavily uh, from economic oppression. And many Turks had to migrate to small enclaves, uh, were even unable to till their own land. Now, what we have to do is that is to uh, run uh, I mean, the Turkish community in the island, the Turkish administration, should run uh, the part they control uh, very efficiently. And uh, we don't intend to uh, partition the island. Uh, we hope that uh, there will be a federal structure. So in a sense, it will be the wealth. It will be the commonwealth of the island. We have already started taking measures to uh, save the crops and the uh, cattle. Uh, I know how the British are sensitive on it. I have been listening to the British uh, Broadcasting Corporation's broadcasts. Uh, and I believe that we shall be able to save the uh, orchards, the citrus, the orange, etc. And uh, to start the uh, touristic installations in places like Famagustain, Kyrenia, operate again. But what about the people? There's a very, very large number of Greek Cypriots have moved out of those areas, those rich areas, and are now refugees. Do you believe that they can feel secure enough, you can make them feel secure enough, that they would wish to come back and live inside the Turkish sector? Well, uh, obviously, they feel they will be very secure in the Turkish area, uh, so that they want to return there. But on the other hand, uh, we are uh, faced with open threats from the Greeks that they intend to start guerrilla activities in the Turkish-controlled area. Uh, this is not uh, sufficient encouragement for us to invite back all the Greeks that have migrated from the now Turkish-controlled zone. What happens to the rest then? Well, you see, there, there, it's a uh, complex problem. The, whereas the Greeks in the Turkish-controlled area obviously feel secure about their lives and properties, the Turks remaining in the Greek-controlled area do not feel secure. Most of them are still held as hostages. They can't return to their enclaves, to their lands. We uh, believe that they should be given the chance of a safe passage to the Turkish-controlled area if they wish to do so. Uh, so we need room for these Turks in the Turkish-controlled area. Which Once, means there won't be room for the Greeks well, if they we don't, return. Well, we don't know how much room there will be left for the Greeks to return. This should be one of the primary issues that should be discussed around the negotiating table, either uh, with the participation of the Garanto Pass or among the uh, two community leaderships. But up in the mountains of Cyprus, there are still the young Greek Cypriots, the young men of Aoka, who are determined not to accept the fate brought to their island by the force of Turkish arms. President Cleridis of Cyprus told Panorama last week of his conviction that trouble was bound to continue. It is my honest opinion that if Turkey intends to remain occupying a large section of uh, the territory of the Republic, the people will fight to liberate that part. And I see no other way in which they will do this except by a pro protracted bloody guerrilla warfare. 
I think that um, a divided island would never see a day of peace. If you force people to give up their land to which they're very much attached, their villages, their homes, the resentment uh, will go from generation to generation and there will be no peace in Cyprus. Prime Minister, you and Turkey were offended by the remarks of Mr. Callaghan after the Geneva Conference that your army might well become a prisoner of, of Cyprus. Is there not a danger that you will get drawn deeper and deeper into Cyprus, particularly if terrorism and guerrilla war start there? Well, uh, I th you should allow me to consider uh, Mr. Callaghan's remarks as a warning uh, in the light of which we must take precautionary measures, that is, uh, to uh, prevent the possibilities of Greek terrorism emerging in the Turkish-controlled area. That should be one of our primary concerns. If uh, most of the Turks, those Turks who wish to do so, settle in the Turkish-controlled area, uh, and vice versa. There may be exceptions, of course, and we will never uh, ask those Greeks who have remained in the Turkish controlled zone to leave the zone. But if this uh, will be the general pattern, there will be no danger of terrorism. And again, if you allow me to say so, the British position in the 50s was entirely different. You see, Britain was inevitably considered as an outside, as an outsider. Whereas the Turks on the island are not outsiders, it is their land also. And they want, what they want to do is to live more safely and freely in their own motherland. Uh, so the situations are very different. I hope and I and uh, let me say, without uh, sounding aggressive, that I don't think we will let terrorism emerge in the Turkish controlled so. zone. Despite the accessibility and frankness of Mr. Echevit, no one should underestimate how strongly the Turks feel about Cyprus and how tough they intend to be. They're sure they were right to put their troops in and also that what they've done since was both correct and justified. They're prepared to negotiate, but they're not prepared to give up their basic point. How far they're gonna get drawn into the quagmire of communal tension in Cyprus, deeper and deeper, they don't know. But they do know that geography is on their side and that they have the strength in Cyprus and they're extremely determined.